Okay, welcome everyone to Social Medicine Grand Rounds. Thank you all for joining us today for this exciting talk by Patricia Garavici. I want to remind you that this talk is sponsored by the Leo Rangel Professorial Endowment and also that our upcoming events uh, in April, May, and June will be having a series of webinars on mass incarceration in the pandemic. The first of these on April 17th, mark your calendars, as a Saturday at 10 in the morning, will be Can the Courts Fix the Crisis of Prison Health? And will feature speakers Sharon Dolovich, Sharon Dolovich of UCLA, Hadar Avaram of UC Hastings, and prisoner activist James King and Jane Dorothy. So I hope you'll all, if you can, you'll join us for that most exciting webinar. It's my pleasure to introduce to you this morning, Patricia Garavici from the University of Pennsylvania. I hear some. Can you put yourselves on mute, folks, if you're not participating in the, in the talk? I think it's Hilly's iPad, if, if someone can mute her for her or for Hilly. Okay, well, meanwhile, I will introduce Patricia. Um, she's the co-founder and director of the Philadelphia Lacan Group in Philadelphia and has won multiple works for her innovative work with Latinx and non-conforming gender clients. Most recently, the 2020 Sigourney Award for Psychoanalytic Enrichment, Achievement, Psychoanalytic Achievement, and the 2021 Gradiva Award for her edited work, Psychoanalysis in the Barrios, for the best edited collection of that year. So without further ado, I am going to introduce to you, my pleasure to introduce to you, Patricia Garavici. Patricia? Yes. Hello. Can you all hear me well? Thank you. I see some friendly faces, familiar friends and other new faces. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Marcia Meldrum, for extending this opportunity to me to share my work with you. Uh, my uh, talk today, I will be reading from the screen, so let me, I will, will momentarily disappear and then I will put back the screen for, for the discussion. Um, let me know if, if there is any problem, if you don't hear me well and so on. Uh, my presentation today, the title is Losing One's Soul, Race, Class, Gender and the Unconscious. And uh, it's inspired by what has been uh, my work in what is considered non-traditional locations for psychoanalytic practice. Uh, but I would like to backtrack my, my discussion and maybe stop for a second and, and think about the, the very war under which uh, our practice, uh, for those like me who identify as psychoanalysts, we often use the word psychoanalyst, not taking into account that the war itself uh, comes from the Greek, the, the, the prefix psyche, and, and it was uh, purposely chosen by Freud to mean soul, uh, a term that according to Bruno Bettelheim is of the richest meaning endowed with emotion, comprehensively human and unscientific. And is in contradiction with the other part of this compound word psychoanalysis because analysis is a word that implies taking apart, dissecting, breaking down into smaller units. It is very clear if one uh, thinks of the word psychoanalysis in German, the way it is pronounced, uh, which I will not dare to do because I do not speak German and my accent in German is terrible. But when one hears that uh, word in German, is the, uh, the accent is clearly on the first syllable, on the psyche, in emphasizing the soul of psychoanalysis. And, and in the history of how this term was invented, the soul preceded the invention of the word in a, a text that dates from 1890. And 
uh, was uh, published six years before the first use of the word psychoanalysis, Freud makes clear that soul would be the best rendition of the meaning of psyche. And he goes to explain that, quote, pathological disorders of the body and soul can be eliminated by mere words. What Freud is doing here is foregrounding the power of speech, of speaking, of being listening to in the treatment. Uh, this emphasis on, on the soul uh, and, and the work that we can do uh, in affecting the body and the soul through speech uh, allow Freud to take distance from other uh, therapeutic methods such as hypnosis. This uh, very purposefully, uh, purposeful use of the, the, the soul in Freud is, we may say, lost in translation, because for instance, in English, the standard edition of the complete works of Freud, 24 volumes edited by James Strachett, every occurrence of the word de cele, which means soul, was consistently mistranslated as mine. And, and this was perhaps part of a gesture that was uh, the destiny of psychoanalysis in the English language of trying to create psychoanalysis as a science of the soul with all the paradoxes and difficulties that that may entail. As Elisarevsky writes in The Secrets of the Souls, this emphasis on, on, on the scientification of the soul narrow the frame of psychoanalysis, it medicalized it, and it produced, quote, a degraded profession, a pseudoscience science whose survival is now very much in doubt, end quote. On the other hand, if psychoanalysis remains this close connection to the soul, it would maintain its power as, quote, a great force for human emancipation. So it's important that psychoanalysis by uh, stressing this soul element, but take clear distance from empirical science. In uh, a text from 1926, The Question of Lay Analysis, Freud clearly makes this uh, gesture of taking distance. He doesn't talk of uh, uh, the psychoanalysis in other terms, but by describing a psychoanalyst as a non-doctor or a layman and arguing that medical education would be the polar opposite of what one needs to learn in order to work effectively with the unconscious. I would also like to mention that the etymology of the word chosen by Freud, a lay from the Latin laicus, that means unconsecrated, derives in fact from the Greek laicos, that means of the people. That is that psychoanalysis should be a psychoanalysis of the people. This emphasis on the soul was an aspect that Freud felt had been downplayed in subsequent theoreticians of psychoanalysis and is something completely lost in other compound names of disciplines that have this prefix psyche Whoa. like psychology or psychiatry. Somebody may have the, the microphone on and hear some noise in the background. So Freud was not the first one to pay attention to the soul, to highlight it. There is a long history of preoccupation with the soul from philosophy to religion to the arts. And I will look back now at another person for whom the soul was of great importance and somebody that preceded Freud by several centuries. And I will refer to uh, the Bishop Friar Bartolomé de las Casas, a 16th century Spanish historian, social reformer, theologian, and Dominican friar who became a controversial figure for trying to convince the Spanish world to adopt a more humane policy of colonization after having witnessed the horrors of how uh, the Spaniard conquistadores were treating the local population in the Americas. Uh, Las Casas is above all known for a famous debate uh, the famous Valladolid debate, 1550-1551, which was the first moral debate in European history questioned the horrendous treatment of the natives in the Spanish colony. And the key for the discussion was to uh, ascertain whether or not the indigenous peoples of the Americas were God creatures endowed with souls. They were uh, to perhaps conceive, be considered equal, human, 
imperial subjects, or if they were deprived of soul, then they could be enslaved, exploited, and uh, treated as they were being treated already. So uh, one of the important points here is that uh, for Las Casas, for citing the Bible and canon law, he declared an universal law that all the world is human and concluded that even though the natives may uh, engage in practice of human sacrifices and other uh, for them questionable customs, the Amerindians were equal beings. The opposing side was represented by Juan Ginés de Sepúlveda, who contended that the natives were barbarians without souls. Despite this moral and theological uh, discussion, there was a very important economic issue at stake, which was the legitimacy of the encomienda system. The encomienda was a form of forced labor that granted to each colonizer a number of natives from a specific community who would provide tributes in the form of labors and, and products. And, uh, and uh, the Spanish colonizers would divide up in that way the native population, forcing them into hard labor and subjecting them to extreme punishments, including death, um, if they resisted this uh, form, of form of enslavement. The encomederos also had another function, which was they were responsible for the natives' conversion to Christian faith to their education in religion and the acquisition of the Spanish language and a sort of protection that they would grant to them. To complicate matters in these discussions was that according to Queen Isabel of Castile, uh, forbidden was, um, she had forbidden slavery. So she had declared the indigenous population free vassals of the crown, equal to Spanish Castilians. Even though the encomienda system was comparable to a feudal relationship of military protection, what it created, and this is an important point I would like us to, to bring up, is that uh, because the encomienda was uh, organized around the encomendados tribal identity and race, uh, I think somebody has the microphone on here, an, an echo, if you can please mute you. and. We'll, come back to unmute ourselves in the discussion. So what I would like to, to, to underline in the encomienda, encomienda system is that the encomienda group was a, based on the tribal's identity and race. For instance, a mixed race mestizo would not be subjected to an encomienda. And many have argued that this system contributed to the colonial invention of racial slavery and a loss of tribal identity. And it is important that in the justification to uh, make legitimate this uh, uh, system uh, and, and in a way justify colonial uh, power and uh, abuses of power, the existence of the native soul was the key. Uh, even though the debate was uh, rhetorically won by Las Casas, the, the, the exploitation was already too widespread and uh, the changes were only nominal. Nevertheless, Las Casas remain a, a symbol of a sort of who, the first questioning of how colonial uh, treatment of the native was exercised and also was the first discussion of a colonial conception of human or what is a human and also was the beginning of our modern conception of alterity. So if we continue our soul searching, we may want to ask ourselves, how does someone become a racialized other? This is a question that Toni Morrison posed in a series of amazing lectures, very thought-provoking re reflections on race, fear, borders, a mass movement of people, and also the desire uh, for belonging that is compiled in a, a very nice book called The Origin of Others from 2017. Uh, Toni Morrison's nuanced meditation is not so much about racial uh, difference because uh, she believes that there is only one race. We are all humans. In fact, it's a meditation about hate. And, uh, and I will quote uh, Morrison who says, race is a classification of a species and we are the human race, period. Maybe Morrison's observation may evoke for us the humanism and universalism of Las Casas, 
that several centuries earlier challenged the horrors of Spanish uh, colonial uh, oppression. Uh, and, and the long lasting of uh, effect psyche consequences of this overarching structure of coloniality can still be observed today in uh, the US barrio enclaves, like the one in North Philadelphia, where I, I have my clinical experience. And it affects both uh, the, the position of the racial oppressor and those who are part of the racialized, colonized other. Uh, all these differences, as we well know, are constructions. They are built tangentially on genes and biological taxonomy, but are above all, from a psychoanalytic perspective, we may say, projective fantasies. Uh, this is something addressed by Morrison, where she discusses the fetishization of skin color in an era of mass migration. And uh, she ponders why human beings invent and reinforce categories of otherness that are ultimately dehumanizing. And what she does that I find very brilliant is that she turns the tables around. She's very original in saying that not only racism objectifies the victims who are stripped off of the humanity and maybe even of their souls, but that racism also dehumanizes the races themselves who would be nothing without it. Here I find echoes of uh, Julia Kristeva, who proposes that we are fundamentally strangers to ourselves, that we are living with another, with a foreigner, uh, within and any time we confront another. What we are challenged by is the possibility of ourselves being another. And, and this concern for the other is not a humanistic concern. Is not a matter of being able to accept the other or being in their place, but rather it means of it's a way of imagining oneself as another for oneself. That uh, in a way uh, we are others to ourselves, and, and this is something that already we could find this idea of the foreigner within in early descriptions in psychoanalysis. If we think that Freud called the unconscious the other sin, uh, the uh, and the Andere Schauplatz, or if we think of the Freudian notion of the drive, the sexual drive, or any more time we have a slip of the tongue when we meant to say one thing and we say another, we see in this sudden manifestation of the unconscious, we hear ourselves speaking a foreign language. Well, we often encounter emergence of the unconscious, we hear them as a foreign language. And, and, and is this a surprise, this uh, stranger within that uh, links uh, the hatred for the foreigner, in fact, with a more basic form of self-hatred, understood here as making oneself other to oneself. Today, if we think of these strategies of other, othering, uh, I don't think that anybody would say that Native Americans do not have a soul. But however, in my own practice, as uh, working as a psychoanalyst in the North Philadelphia barrio, anytime I mention this experience, I there's sort of a knee-jerk reaction of surprise that I think we are then confronted with the same racist attitude that underlined the Las Casas Sepulveda debate of the 17th century. Uh, because anytime I mention that I have conducted psychoanalytic practice with poor Puerto Ricans uh, and other Latinos, uh, there is always this, this uh, doubt. The, the idea that may be underlying is that psychoanalysis could not work for minorities, for people of color, for poor people. And I often uh, say, uh, a joke that I repeated too many times, but I'm tempted to say it again, and I will indulge, is, is as if they would, would believe that peer, poor, poor people are so poor that they cannot afford to have an unconscious. In fact, they're not only denying them an unconscious, they're also denying them a soul. And, and here again, we see attack the, 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 the return of, of Las Casas arguments on, on the soul, or even this racism reemerges in, uh, I think it's relevant here, uh, where I did work on the so-called attack of the, the nervous or Puerto Rican syndrome, which is considered in the DSM as a conversion disorder. 
And, and I argue this is a curious return of a repressed racism in certain psychiatric practices. For many years, I would say since I think the mid 90s, I have been uh, pushing for a socially responsible practice of psychoanalysis. One that uh, is not so much innovative, but rather that does not forget that as the origins of this profession, that the origins of psychoanalysis were quite radical. Uh, and this is interestingly enough, a for forgotten chapter, not only uh, in general, but it's a forgotten chapter in the history of psychoanalysis, also for many psychoanalysts, for most psychoanalysts, I may say. And this is something that I had been documented by Elizabeth Danto in 2005, when she talked about Freud's free clinics uh, during the First World War I and uh, Second World War II. Uh, there were 20 free clinics that were uh, open all throughout Europe. And the idea was that psychoanalysis could uh, have a, a role to, to play, an important play, and who have a, a productive impact on underprivileged classes. And, and we may say that Freud was appealing to the soul of society. Uh, there is a famous speech he gave even before the end of First World War in 1918 in uh, Budapest, when he appealed uh, to the soul of society and of the colleagues of a, a, a psychoanalyst, when he stated something that we may say is obvious, that the poor have as much right as the rich to benefit from the help provided by psychoanalysis. In 1918, Freud envisioned something that he called psychotherapy for the people. And he argued that uh, it would be a type of treatment whose structure and composition would follow the model of, quote, a strict and untendacious psychoanalysis. When Freud gave this soulful call for social justice, Freud was, uh, uh, in a way, reminding that the psychoanalyst had a political role to play. Uh, and this is something that has been uh, forgotten in the history of psychoanalysis, especially in the American adaptation of psychoanalysis, where psychoanalysis uh, until the 1980s was mostly practiced by physicians and became a sort of uh, medical subspecialty. And what is forgotten is that uh, analysts, at least um, I'm, I'm talking about the uh, 19, uh, 1918, 1939, Analysts saw themselves as brokers of change, both at the level of the individual, of course, but also at the level of society. And uh, this, uh, has, this has, I hear it, sorry. Somebody can mute them. So this, this initiative of Freud uh, in, uh, that was successful in Europe found an echo in the United States in the 1940s. And I'm referring here to uh, the clinic uh, Lafargue, named after the Afro-Cuban physician and philosopher Paul Lafargue, uh, a mixed race Cuban, and also Karl Marx, son in love, and author of the notorious essay, The Right to Be Lazy. This is a, a clinic that opened in a basement in Harlem and was uh, founded by Frederick Bertham, Richard Wright, and Earl Brown. And I, I mentioned this uh, because they believe, the Lafarge Clinic, believe that psychoanalysis could undo the negative effects of segregation. And they trusted psychoanalysis to rethink race, leading to an anti-racist clinical approach capable of overcoming segregation. And here I move from the basement of a church in Harlem to maybe uh, the Barrio Soul and ask together the question, and I hope we can think together, whether or not psychoanalysis as they thought in the 40s, couldn't do the effects of racism today. And this is a question that raises both possibilities and maybe responsibilities as well. So I will, uh, in order to uh, address this maybe in a more uh, 
perhaps illustrative way, I will um, share with you what I call a barrio story. And this is uh, the story of a patient I will call Ramona. The protagonist of my clinical vignette is a middle-aged woman originally from the Dominican Republic who once came to therapy very flustered, very upset. And she sat on the chair in the office and said in a very upset manner that dirty blacks had moved to her block. Even though she herself, Ramona, had very dark brown skin. The Ramona did not identify as black because she spoke Spanish. She assumed herself to be part of this amorphous crowd, so-called Hispanic crowd, and identify with the hegemonic racialized discourse that used language to construct racial difference. Because Ramona's symptom was racism, I dealt with it uh, without immediately combating it or even attempting to reduce it. I tried to understand what was the function of her racism. I, my first hypothesis was that the hate she experienced for her new neighbors could only be released if she could understand her subjective implication in, in her necessity to construct this other. And this was granted to me when uh, the hated neighbors started appearing in her dreams. Like her symptom of racism, her dreams granted a form of displaced satisfaction. And reading her dreams like a text, I found a scriptic message that Ramona was sending to herself. And through the work of the therapy, Ramona herself became aware of this coded message and also of the investment in neighbors that I will say she hated as much as she hated herself. There was a simple word association to the material of the dream. The dream was uh, short, she was at a party at the neighbor's house and proved this, this association proved quite revelatory. I asked her what came to mind and she first thought about the saying in Spanish, mi casa es su casa my house is your house, or what's mine is yours. And she was very surprised that these detested neighbors would show up in her dream. And not only that, they were so nice to her, welcoming to their home. And she exclaimed, ay bendito, oh bless, an expression equivalent to sweet Jesus. When I repeat back to her, ay bendito, and ask what comes to mind, she heard, when she heard me say I, she heard the pronunciation of Haiti, IT, and that's how it's pronounced in Spanish, her first language. Here appeared on the scene another racialized other in, that exposed the prejudice of the Dominican Republic, a, a prejudice of which Ramona herself was often a victim. There is a systematic xenophobia in, in the Dominican Republic against darker skin Haitians. And because of her dark skin color, very often Ramona had been discriminated against. Often she was suspected of being Haitian. And it was a common occurrence for her while she lived in the Dominican Republic that the authorities would stop her. And whenever she left her house, casa, she would have to show her cedula, which was an identification document, an ID in which uh, her ethnicity, her race, and her immigration status were stated. Also, talking about the dream, Ramona acknowledged that she secretly felt like an impostor. Fundamentally, she had a suspicion that she was perhaps of Haitian descent. And as a child, she would often hear jokes in the family that would be mocking her father uh, as her parents and grandparents had lighter skin. And this biological kirk, this pigment of an unknown, darker skin ancestor, made for Ramona quite difficult to grow up in a society based on race and prejudice. So we may say that here race appears not only as intolerance of difference, but an intolerance of a repudiated excessive sameness. If the characteristics that define the other as an other, other to me, get blurred, 
those who identify as not like them can feel the identity threatened. That is to say that the negation of the other is correlative of the self's affirmation. To see one's neighbor reflect and mirror oneself too much may threaten a person's unique sense of self. The implicit idea is that the external other is tasked with defining the internal. In Ramona's hatred of her Philadelphia neighbors, she was replicating the racism of which she had herself been a victim while trying to assert an identity that was built on similarity constructed as different. Yeah. But to, to get to the key here, it's important well, because you know he's sending and you're sending, and I, I hear you don't accept anything back. I mean, it's all one way. I mean, but I don't get any response from somebody. Me. Needs to mute your. your I, I, yeah, I, I think I, I, I did. I think I found. But thank you. So to to continue thinking through the problem of the other, I think we need to also tackle a certain unconscious profit. Uh, that I said play for Ramona and I think for anyone who indulges in this type of mechanism. One thing that Ramona said, if we go back to that initial session when she was complaining about the new neighbors in her blog, was that she complained that the neighbors were loud, that they were always sitting outside on the step as if they owned the sidewalk, that they were unfriendly, that they have too many people over, that they play loud music, that they even barbecued on the sidewalk. In other words, she thought that they had access to some strange enjoyment from which she needed to take distance. You, the neighbors, are not like us. And not only did the neighbors seem to enjoy themselves in some alien and unfamiliar manner, in doing so, they also spoiled Ramona's fun. Here is how I intervene. First, identify the fundamental problem at work. Ramona was creating a racist fantasy in which the other's enjoyment was inversely proportional to her own. She believed that the presence of the new neighbors would ultimately force her to move. And, and there, I found out that Ramona, in fact, uh, when she moved to this uh, block, which was just a few years uh, earlier, she was herself disturbed by the pleasure associated with living where she lived. Now she was living north of the Roosevelt Boulevard, an avenue that functions in uh, Philadelphia as a marker of upward social mobility in the barrio. All was great for Ramona until these people, whom she called esos prietos, those blacks moved to her block. It looked as if she claimed that they did not belong there. But in fact, what was happening was that Ramona herself felt that she did not belong. She all along felt that she was an outsider to the new neighbors. That in fact, she hated the neighbors because she, they look at ease, they look happy. They were enjoying their new surroundings and not even they were enjoying it, they were enjoying it maybe too much. There was a disruptive excess that she ascribes to the neighbor, but in fact, that Ramona was herself experiencing. And by imagining that she was going to have to move out of this neighborhood because of the other, of forcing her, she was making the neighbors regulate this excess. So this projection of the racist fantasies allowed Ramona to regulate her own enjoyment reinstating a balance in a situation that even though it was best positive force for Ramona overwhelming. So we see that above all the racist fantasy is not only a regulator but also a sort of veil, a screen to cover over a constitutional abyss. There was nothing behind it. So it was a matter of time before she would arrive at the root of her problem in so far as she was able to fantasize that the neighbors were stealing her enjoyment, so then the, the blog would be perfect, everything was ideal until the neighbors arrived. So she can construct this ideal lost space. And of course, she would come up with the idea, if only the neighbors would have moved elsewhere in the barrio, I could finally enjoy myself, which is an inner dialogue that is quite classic, stereotypical. If we could only get rid of the other, the immigrant, the Jew, the black, the gay, the atheist, the communist, and so on, if we can be without the other, everything would be perfect. Uh, we, of course, become aware that this is a, a strategy to maintain a fantasy of an 
perfect and spoiled ideal society, which is obviously impossible. So Ramon identifies this necessary other and projects this position of other to the black neighbors and is able to create a fantasy of then a perfect situation if it could ex exclude this other that needs to be constructed, projected onto the neighbors. Uh, what I think is important is that the, the racist fantasy avoids for Ramona the, the, having to deal with the personal upheaval that her enjoyment entail for her. I could find a different kind of economy uh, in this excess when I would find another way out for excess, which was the strategy of laughter. And, and by making jokes, by using humor, I was able to challenge all these assumptions that Ramona had. And, and eventually Ramona was in a place where she could accept the neighbors uh, because she first of all could accept a measure of dissatisfaction without needing the screen of a racist fantasy as a placeholder for an impossible ideal. Uh, there was this excess projected onto the other that concealed the truth of her own failed enjoyment. And, and only when Ramon accepted this inconvenient and limiting dynamic, she was able to achieve some agency and some, some space open up and she achieved a modicum of freedom, of, uh, modicum of freedom from, from the, the symptom of laughter. And, and it's important that by way of jokes, a distance was introduced, created that in a way uncovered the fragile construction that was supporting her racism and lifted this paranoid mechanism of projection. Rather than exacerbating the minor differences, she was able to overcome the fear that she had of becoming a stranger herself, a dark skinned foreigner that could in turn be racialized and dehumanized. Even though if Ramona's analysis began by consulting my supposed doctor-like expertise in the context of the Barrio Clinic, a place that maybe just to give you a context used to be uh, before uh, I were there, the, this building with is uh, my, my office had this incongruent wooden paneling and very tired, lumpy orange carpet, but it was very spacious. I found out later that this same building used to be a funerary home and that my office where uh, I was trying to help um, create a space where a modicum of freedom from symptoms could be achieved used to be the same room where uh, the corpses were brought for a last goodbye for a last viewing. So it was very interesting in this tension between life and death that maybe there was a space to, to, to choose life in that space I created as it were, a sort of Freudian theater. There was no couch in my office, but I move around the butter chairs and I move back to a corner the, the desk and I created a space where nevertheless psychoanalysis was not only possible, but I, I found out much needed. I, I think that what uh, was able to, to happen in that situation is that uh, in the room that was a place for the dead and the mourners, uh, there was a space that became a, a consultation room where the unconscious could, be, could speak and be heard. And not only heard by myself as a practitioner, but that uh, like Ramona, that the analysts themselves could hear themselves and, and uh, 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 assume a different um, form of agency. So uh, I, I was there not so much in the role of a professional or a knowledge keeper, but rather of somebody who could allow for a new desire to emerge, a desire for difference. Um, what I think psychoanalysis offered to Ramona was a place where she was not an object but rather a subject, a grammatical subject, a subject taken at her word and, and gave her a space for transformation, a space with emancipatory potential, a space that not only tolerates difference, but desires. I will conclude 
hoping that we can start thinking maybe psychoanalytically about symptoms of hate, like racism, discrimination, exclusion, uh, because mm, after the COVID-19 pandemic and the growing awareness of violent discrimination, we are finding out that death does not make us equal, that uh, for uh, black and brown skin people, the rates of death are uh, three times those of white people, so that uh, this growing awareness of this, uh, the, the deadly consequences of discrimination, uh, the deadly effect of a structural racism, the impact of the Black Lives Matter movement. I, I think that no psychoanalyst can uh, pretend to be immune to the cultural context in which we work. And, and I think this is a moment where we could also start addressing the hegemonic whiteness of psychoanalysis. There has been a very productive uh, recent theorizing in what has been called transgender psychoanalysis, but uh, this work with a few exceptions has not engaged as much with race or whiteness in psychoanalysis. And, and as a first step, I think we need to acknowledge that uh, there is a structural function of a uh, hatred of a uh, othering in our psyche that is related to this possibility of being another uh, and furthermore if we assume that we all have another within that this hatred for the other in fact is our own i hope that the brief clinical vignette i share with you proves that there is a possibility of opening up a space where prejudice, racism, and discrimination can transform themselves into something else, symptoms that could be treated. And, uh, and I think that contrary to the, the common belief that uh, people, uh, uh, poor people are so uh, consumed by mm, the, the, the demands of uh, everyday life that they can only benefit from a symptom focus and concrete interventions. I think that indeed there are problems that need to be addressed uh, by social real means, but that doesn't exclude uh, taking into account the, the unconscious negotiation of these problems. And, and I think that psychoanalysis could facilitate the productive exploration of the unconscious realm that underpins symptomatic uh, behavior. And, uh, and I think it's, uh, Again, not a charitable gesture, it's not just a humanitarian respect for the other, but something that has to do with an ethical stance uh, that uh, is, a, we may even say that a psychoanalysis that does not take into account this social responsibility would be anti-psychoanalytic, I may say. And, and, and in a way, I think I want to, to um, highlight that my idea is not so much of a, a bringing psychoanalysis to the barrio, but rather that bringing this a, more to the front, this otherness that is part of psychoanalysis itself. Uh, and, uh, and I would advocate again in, in trying to uh, support a model that is not utilitarian, that differs from the kinds of standardized behavioral therapies, mechanically reproducing many mental health centers in these uh, social locations uh, that ultimately uh, end up functioning as centers of social control uh, that I think they fail to recognize and engage with the subjectivity of those who may be culturally other in a way replicating the same model of segregation that I think listening to the unconscious to the singularity to the uniqueness of each uh, particular uh, situation of each uh, person in particular would be not only um, restoring dignity to uh, these populations as subjects, but also could undo these uh, alienating effects of uh, standardization and, and that are in a way segregating them. So I think uh, to go back to this uh, speech that Freud made in 1918 when uh, he called for a psychoanalysis for the people, I think that psychoanalysis has a responsibility and a possibility to alleviate the vast amount of misery that there is in the world and perhaps does not need to be. And like Freud said in 1918, that psychoanalysis could be as available uh, as surgery and as needed as the cure for tuberculosis. And, and let's not forget that as psychoanalysts, uh, as many clinicians, uh, I, I, we are uh, not maybe in the 
hospitality industry in the sense that uh, we run hotels, but not far from that, if we think that it is a practice of hospitality, that even in, in we are opening our, our space and, and we are hosting, and, and, and even in private practice, one could offer what I call an unconventional welcome uh, to people of all socioeconomical backgrounds, bringing, as it were, the barrio even into a middle-class bourgeois setting. Uh, I don't think nobody who may want to benefit from psychoanalysis needs to be excluded. And, and in my own personal experience, I, I try to have a more inclusive uh, practice in terms of class uh, that combines patients who pay full fields with others who fees tailored to whatever they can afford. And this is how I could democratize my private office. Because I speak Spanish and also I speak Portuguese. Right now, I'm currently working in my private office with many uh, Mexican and Brazilian analysts uh, who may be construction workers or house cleaners. And, uh, and, and this flexibility, I think, could allow me to welcome uh, analysts that have been traditionally excluded and even considered not good candidates for psychoanalysis. Uh, and this uh, war with so-called marginalized communities that began with Latinx patients has also expanded to include gender and sexual variant people. And this we may call is a, a departure from traditional psychoanalysis, but I would argue that is going back to um, a, a, the very early days of psychoanalysis, where psychoanalysis was oriented more toward progressive transformations for people, and that uh, uh, we shouldn't use class, uh, or maybe at times uh, certain heteronormative ideas, to segregate people with oppressive notions of what's good for psychoanalysis was normal. Uh, in my life, just to, to end my talk, I would say that. Uh, I have the echo in my mind of a phrase of the psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan, who recommended that psychoanalysts should avoid the temptation of uh, conformity and adaptation, uh, because then they will transform themselves into what he called engineers of the soul. That is technicians, technicians who treat people like malfunctioning machines without a psyche, without a soul. I prefer to think of psychoanalysis uh, following this uh, beautiful uh, summary of what's the task of analysis that was uh, rendered by the poet H.D., who wrote about her treatment with Freud, and uh, she called Freud a midwife to the soul. Here, rather than a technocrat fixing a broken engine, a psychoanalyst appears as someone assisting in the birthing process of a more enabled subject. As we have seen, Ramona recovered a little humanity, a little of her soul by questioning her other in strategies. She no longer appealed to content, to construct difference, a difference that she projected onto the neighbors. She did not need an outsider to define herself. My experience conducting psychoanalytic cures with people from the barrio has shown me that psychoanalytic principles can be applied with beneficial results to clinical work with Latinx patients affected by poverty. And I think this uh, uh, defines uh, an ethical position above all that should not be forgotten by psychoanalysts because I think that if a psychoanalysis loses its social responsibility, it also loses its soul. Thank you. And uh, now I will uh, open, maybe if you have questions, let me see if there are comments in the chat, if anybody has any question, any comment. Um, this if you is have the a moment. comment um, or if you have a question, feel free to put it in the chat, but also just unmute okay. yourself and speak up. Uh, I want to congratulate you. This is inspirational and very much needed. Um, I am delighted to um, see the Rangel um, tradition of openness and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, accessibility with accountability and ethics um, to be moved forward. Um, I had the great fortune as a foreign student in America 
to reanalyze by Leo Rangel. And I consider that um, uh, really, um, I still talk to him in my mind. Uh, <laughs> it goes on forever. Uh, uh, at age 82. <laughs> so I want to thank you very much because there was a period that I was very worried what did happen to the Rangel um, endowment <laughs> at UCLA? But this is uh, really terrific. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Oh, and very welcome. Be because indeed, the, it is interesting that uh, in, in other uh, geographical or social political contexts, high psychoanalysis has been uh, developed very differently. Often in, in Latin America, is a uh, more associated uh, with uh, positions that are more progressive than in the US. I think in the US, and this has been um, documented Nathan Hale and by many historians of uh, uh, psychoanalysis that the Americanization of the unconscious was a medicalization that uh, created an illusion of depoliticization because uh, uh, and at times it was a sordid calculation. A psychoanalyst wanted to make as much money as a plastic surgeon. And I don't think you can get Botox five times a week. But we, I, I, I use the contrary example. I think that's a, a practice that doesn't have a social conscience. I would do not call that psychoanalytic. I think it's a sort of distortion of an adaptation of psychoanalysis that we should call it someone else, well, something else, sorry. That when we look at Woody Allen's films, and we see here stories of uh, patients who have been for 30 years uh, in analysis five times a week. Uh, I would not call those uh, Freudian analysis, at least because Freud uh, in, in a text that I think is from 1913, if I recall well, apologizes to the audience and says psychoanalysis takes too long. The results, uh, we don't see them immediately. It takes in very difficult cases, six months at most a year. So. We may say, say that Freud invented brief therapy or that what we think psychoanalysis is today by way maybe of the mostly the popularization of psychoanalysis in the United States in the 1950s is very, very far from what we may call the ethics of a psychoanalytic practice or even the tradition if we go back to the, uh, the history of the free clinics. I, I have a, uh, I want to add something. Excuse me for taking sure, the sure. time. No, no, no. I am... Uh, I am a World War II baby. I grew up in Athens, Greece during the war. Th three months after I was born, the bomb started. And then what made me a psychiatrist and a psychoanalyst is the Greek Civil War that um, adversely affected the life of my brother, the baby. Mm -hmm. uh, and he died on the 28th of December, just a few months ago. Um, but he had a full life because of my parents and they saw to it that he did. Anyway, the point I'm making is that Freud wrote a small paper about visiting the Acropolis. Mm -hmm. And the point I wanna make is that psychoanalysis is based on the Socratic dialogue. Mm -hmm. Remember, Socrates and Jesus Christ were both killed by their own kind because they were visionaries. Who was ready to hear that nobody knows? Are you kidding? I, I mean, no way. The Athenians had to kill him. There was a due process. They respected the law and he could have escaped. And he said no, because the law had just been invented and he stood by the principle. And the same thing with uh, Christ and love, you know. Uh, um, Joseph uh, Natterson has just published a small on the internet book that psychotherapy is a mutual loving relationship. Mm -hmm. So I submit that psychoanalysis as its best is promoting the integrity of knowing who you are and using your rational mind, because I view all babies as being scientists. Mm -hmm. Every baby is a scientist because the question is what the hell is going on? Mm -hmm. I mean, perception doesn't tell you anything. You have to construct it. Mm -hmm. And that's how your brain develops. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a terrific opportunity with your inspiration to get us back to the fundamentals. 
Mm -hmm. And right. the ethics must lead, otherwise mm -hmm. we lose our soul. Thank okay. you very Good. much. <laughs> Thank you. See, I see questions on the chat box. So uh, there is one question. question. Yeah. Yeah. One, uh, my psychoanalysis be the cure for white supremacist implicit bias? Well, I wouldn't be that ambitious. It would be wonderful if I could answer that question in the affirmative. Nevertheless, I think that it could problematize. Uh, there is one uh, issue that has been discussed a lot in the last uh, few months, which is the whiteness of psychoanalysis with a group of psychoanalysts mostly based in New York. We started a very active conversation online and then developed into a reading group. And uh, we had a fantastic uh, discussion with Frank Wilderson on Afro-pessimism. And, and uh, let's not forget that uh, I don't think psychoanalysis can cure racism, but could as the could uh, challenge the uses of racism as a symptom and symptomatize. And if it becomes a symptom and it's questioned as such, it could be uh, analyze and maybe transform into something else. What uh, definitely we we know is that, for instance, somebody like Frank Wilderson, he uses, and this connects me with the next question from uh, Bernon Rosario, he uses Lacan, or if we think of Frank Fanon, uh, who responds to another Lacanian, to Manoni, to propose a, a, a critique of, a, of a colonialism, racism, using elements from psychoanalysis, I think that, and the question here of Bernard Rosario is, do you feel a Lacanian perspective lends itself particularly to theorizing race or treating lower income patients versus classical Freudian, uh, for instance, with an uh, Oedipal reductionism? I think that there are many elements, like Freud, for instance, does not talk directly about race, but uh, he has wonderful theorizations on uh, hate. And, uh, and I think behind, I would follow there Toni Morrison that the psychic mechanism at play in racism is hate. And, and Freud is very clear in, in his uh, metapsychology of, of hate, if we can do that. And, and I have been working precisely in the last couple of months, I have been personally uh, going back to, to reading Freud and, and working on these issues, which I think are, uh, uh, I wouldn't say classical Freudian, Oedipal, maybe not, but yes, uh, the meta, meta psychology of hatred, hatred when, of hate, when Freud says that uh, for the child, the, the most primal emotion is hate. Love is a secondary thing, that first is hate and then maybe love may or may not follow. And that uh, also, if we think of racism, that there is always an other in psychic life, uh, that uh, the baby to survive needs another. If there is no other feeding the baby, taking care of the baby, the human offspring dies. And that this uh, dependence on the other, uh, that was an observation very early from Freud, for the project for, uh, from 1895. He notes that this uh, extreme dependence on another who is always present in, in, in psychic life and, and in practical terms for the survival of the, of the newborn and, and young baby is also the basis, this dependence of the baby on others or on another and a care, caretaker is the basis for moral feelings. And here we could find strategies to undo certain mm, disposition, psychic disposition for hate that could be undone. So I would say that we could take elements from Freud, definitely from Lacan, also in terms of lower income patients, uh, the idea that Lacan uh, thinks of the unconscious as structured like a language. And, in that sense, is uh, uh, anyone, no matter what income they have, anyone who is, is, uh, has access to language, who dreams, who has uh, libidinal fantasies, anyone could be a good candidate to benefit from talk therapy. So that's, that's I, I think, uh, I would say that it is, in, we can find, yes, in, in both in Freud and Lacan, elements to, 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 to work productively on these issues. So, uh, okay, somebody's asking, the, the recording will be made available. I see yeah, here in the worry. comments. 
great. So then, Philippe Bourgeois, this is- I, I just wonder um, um, Patricia, that there's some people with the, who've had their hands up who are not in the chat. Ah, okay, so I don't, let me see if I can- And I think Janice Carter has had a question in the chat for, for a while now. It is, thank okay, you good. so much. Can you hear me? Yes. Great, okay, so first of all, thank you so very much. I had a difficult time with my Mac not working and now they can't even use it for court video because they don't like the Apple system. But I wanna say thank you very much for your lecture and for your heart. Because the one thing I've learned, because I'm 70, the one thing I've learned through working with therapy patients for a number of decades is if they feel that you love them, they do better. And the same is true for all medical practice. And my patients will tell me that. And after a while I began to believe them because I realized that they were true and also the research supported it. But it's very important that we also look at how people communicate and how they learn and how they define intelligence. And I have patients who are indigenous native speakers who do not do much in the way of reading what we read or taking notes the way we take notes, but they have phenomenal memories for history. Mm -hmm. That's how they preserve things. And so they have become, shall we say, not so much complicit, but frightened because they feel as though more than likely they're not intelligent because they can't do what the psychoanalysis says. They can't take those notes. They can't keep track. And I found that redefining intelligence to be a larger phenomenon than just being able to read and write has been very helpful and has, been, has allowed me to explain to a parent, your child is brilliant, but he's also autistic. And there's less of a conflict when they realize that we're looking at things separately. And with regard to therapy with the millennial patients that I take care of, who I very much like, even though they cancel every day, four times in a row, they finally get their act together. And you realize that they have the same anxieties that everybody else does. And they don't really know how psychoanalysis works until they get the sense of it. And when they get the sense that they're important, they're loved, they're valued, then suddenly you get all this information, which you wouldn't have gotten if they felt they were on the hierarchical level of just not being important enough. Mm -hmm. And unless we get finished with that hierarchy and make it sort of like top shelf and then the bottom, in which case none of which applies, you need a chair to go to either one, then you don't really need to use it. It's not a worthwhile situation. And mm -hmm. Freud did a lot of great things because he actually outed the whole idea of incest when his colleagues didn't want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. He's done a lot of very interesting things and I value him and I'm as well. But I want to say thank you because so many of the patients that I see are afraid of psychoanalysis because they think it's beyond them or they're beneath it. And either of those perspectives is not conducive to health. So thanks very much. But thank you very much for your comments. Indeed, I, I cannot agree more that I think uh, uh, what for even in, in terms of a, a class difference, often uh, the professional in, in a clinic in the barrio will be somebody college educated and most likely from a middle class background. But what you are uh, highlighting in your comments is that if there is a so-called capital, if we think in, in terms of a econom political economy, the, if there is one wealth in the room or one knowledge, it resides in the unconscious, in the fantasies, in the material, in the association is what the uh, patient who is not that patient is active. I don't think it's a client because I don't like to apply this mercantilistic, it's not a consumer, but so the other person in the room, the analysis, I would say, I find that a better terminology is the one who who, if there is a knowledge, is not in the diplomas that the practitioner may have, or how many uh, books um, the, uh, and the analyst may have read, is said uh, that there is a knowledge there would be the knowledge that would emerge from this interaction, and that there will be a wealth produced, that there will be a capital produced if we use this uh, uh, economical model, and that. Uh, in a way, the, the best way, and uh, you were uh, ex exacerbating the heart, the heart, I think I would call that in, in psychoanalytic terms, the desire, my desire to listen and be there. And, but in fact, in, when I encounter, every time I encounter an in, in patient, be a new patient or somebody who have been coming to see me for a while, uh, I, I don't really know much that if there is something that will emerge is from what they bring and what will be elaborated in that interaction. And, and, and I think what uh, we are talking about is a different kind of uh, interaction where uh, it's not the professional um, abusing a, a power or a certain class a, a strategy that in that moment, at least for that very brief moment, 
the, the usual dynamics of society could be put in suspension. And one thing that is uh, important to, to think is that a psychoanalysis, even when patients may have a very nominal copay, uh, they pay to work. So in a way it goes against the typical capitalistic exchange where one pays for commodities. So it's a model of a different social dynamic that could have emancipatory potential. And I think this is what, what you're talking about, that one should, if one uh, does not perpetuate those uh, inequalities of society, we could have an opportunity to, to war with what they have to bring. And it doesn't have to do with, uh, I think, uh, when you were saying intelligence, we need to have a, a, a better, if, if we render intelligent or non-intelligent, uh, if we ascribe uh, ideas of intelligence wrongly, then we have to question our model of what we call intelligence, not the person that we are mislabeling. So Thank it's you. our responsibility. Thank you. But more more uh, raise hands. It's, we have had. Have... Um, I have yes. a question. Yes, um, so thank you for your talk. I think psychoanalysis is an extremely powerful tool and the fact that you're providing it to people who usually don't have access to it is great. Um, but I do sort of wonder if you're not in some ways maybe perpetuating the same colonial values that you're seeking to fight in some ways. Um, people say that psychoanalysis is sort of based on universal human values, but it was actually developed, you know, in a very specific location, sort of Austria and Germany. Mm -hmm. You can see the specific, like in Carl Jung's Red Book, Christianity is all over this. Mm -hmm. um, and I noticed you sort of saying things about racist ideas that seem sort of based on these universal values of sort of European acceptance and things like that. I think we all agree racism is a bad thing, but previously in psychology- uh, love, Jacob, your, your, comp, your question's great and it's super important, but um, there's tons of people that are um, wanna ask questions. So if you could um, maybe um, sh not, not talk too, too long. It is an important question. So I, we, I'd love to hear Patricia's response, but, but don't go on for too, 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 too long. And I apologize for interrupting you. No, right. that's fine. I and guess also, other people, if she, if 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 Patricia doesn't have time to uh, answer your question, please um, send the question to her um, and uh, by email. Uh, and if you don't have her email address or can't find it online, send it to Marsha, and she can forward it. And thank you, Patricia. This has really been wonderful. I appreciate you. your you. energy on this. Okay, so I guess put succinctly, how do you avoid? imposing universalist European values on your patients, like anti-racism? Because I noticed you said, for example, people have more soul when they're less racist, which seems quite sort of judgmental, actually, and sort of the hierarchical thing you're trying to avoid. So how do you avoid doing that and really become a true midwife that's not imposing these values, but maybe letting these patients talk from their own positionality that might be totally different from the sort of value system that's embedded in psychoanalysis? Mm -hmm. I, I would, I think they, by, we were talking about dynamics of power in the case of Ramona, the, she, she was alienated in her own speech. She wasn't owning what she was saying. In that sense, she had lost her soul because she wasn't uh, aware of uh, uh, this, uh, the remarks she was making were in a way uh, replicating a, a segregation machine that also victimized her on a daily basis. If we look at her own experience in the Dominican Republic where she was discriminated based upon her skin color and uh, that her own uh, existence in the Dominican Republic was one of the reasons why she moved to the US was that she felt she didn't belong. So she was reproducing the same model of alienation. So I apply, she lost her soul and I, I hope I didn't impose on her uh, my own definition of what a soul is or, or not. I, in terms of, you bring an important point is the decolonization of psychoanalysis. And in a sense, I would uh, try to follow Freud himself, who indeed was a product of a European uh, turn of the century bourgeois uh, Jewish life. He nevertheless, for instance, there's a very interesting uh, interview of him with Vereke, he chose in uh, pre-Second uh, pre World War uh, Austria to identify as a Jew. And he talked of himself as a racialized subject. And, and he knew that that racialized discourse that in a way he returns, he, when he's uh, in, in this interview with Vereke, who is a, 
himself a Nazi sympathizer. He gave us a nice example of how to decolonize psychoanalysis because he sends back the same racist discourse. And uh, he says, oh, I speak German, but I'm a Jew. And he ended up, let's not forget, he ended up dying in exile, having to leave uh, Austria. And he ended up, like many people today, as a displaced uh, political refugee. With, uh, he had temporary paper card. He died without a nationality, even though he was nominally a German citizen at the time. Important for psychoanalysts today to uh, talk about the uh, almost at times unspeakable whiteness of psychoanalysis if you look at the composition of uh, most psychoanalytic institutions, uh, they are predominantly white, that there is in itself in the discourse of psychoanalysis a, a, another imposition and that's something developed by uh, Betty Fuchs on Freud's idea of Jewishness that is not being Jewish in the sense of religion, but in the sense of being an other. And the definition would be that psychoanalysis to operate effectively has to be positioned as another. And in that sense, it's structurally not in the position of the colonizing European, but what is excluded in that dynamic. That when psychoanalysis, and this is the sad history of psychoanalysis in the United States, because it wanted to side with the colonizer, with uh, the conquistadores, uh, and, and maybe gather the encomienda of as many rich patients as they could on Park Avenue, then it, it, it replicated something that made psychoanalysis stop being psychoanalysis. So I think it's, it's an important point and there has been a lot being discussed and following also the, the legacy of Fanon that precisely uses psychoanalysis to come up with an anti-colonialist discourse. Okay, Patricia, I don't wanna hold you up, but you've got three, at least three yes, questions. Please, please. The, back. the first- You can give me a hand also because I'm, I'm not following well the, the, the hands and yeah. the- there are also you comments on the verbal chat. Please, please yeah, could, could you could you read? So I can I can read the questions for you if that okay. makes it easier. Yeah. Yes, so, please, please. Okay, so there's there's two questions. I'm going to give them both to you simultaneously because of the time constraints, and I know there'll be other people as well who want to ask questions. So um, the first is from Philippe. Um, my ethnography with uh, primarily Puerto Ricans from the blocks you're describing inside the Philadelphia. Actually, Lori, don't do it alienated. It's your ethnography too. You can be, be totally, totally <laughs> right, um, no. psychoanalytically open. I'm just reading. <laughs> I'm just reading the way. It I'm should. actually in psychoanalysis because Lori and I are having trouble writing this up. Our, our, our whatever fifteen okay. ethnography. Sorry, in your in in the in the streets that you're describing. Actually, okay. And our <laughs> landlord was Dominican, and both our neighbors neighbors were Dominican, um, but okay. they were Remedy. the oppressed minority on our block, actually, right. which is interesting. Okay. So this is this is a question about, um, um, you know, the the relationships um, in, in the relationship with the prison and jail system um, that um, that uh, Philippe, I'm sorry, I, I can't really make sense with this question. I, I'm going to ask you to, to articulate this, but wait. No, I on. just wanted to, I, I, I was just free associating from your very moving lecture because um, uh, one of the reasons we haven't been able to write this ethnography of the carceral mismanagement and the police violence mismanagement of, uh, of suffering in the neighborhood is because everyone we made friends with and became close to are serving time in prison and are chronically, uh, since we met them free as our neighbors uh, and are now chronically caught in that, in that cycle. And the relationship that, we, that happens with us becomes very psychoanalytic in a sense, is that we bond together, we get freaked out by it, they're freaked out by it. And they do get re repeatedly released and they do call us up and they love us and we love them and we can't do anything 
to keep them from getting reelected. Uh, re that was a good Freudian slip, F from getting uh, <laughs> reincarcerated, and also sometimes re-killing someone on the block, uh, or most of the time, actually 100% of the time, getting re re restarting to use um, mostly heroin, you know, mostly opioid pills, but sometimes spice, you know, sometimes other of the newest pills, that, that newest drugs that are hitting the neighborhood. So I guess yeah, sorry for that. So me, I didn't me, know me... if the jail thing, the prison thing, I mean, there is a magic to that sociality that takes place in jail, tragically, in the suffering of jail. And I and it breaks my heart that there aren't radical psychoanalysts who violate all rules of the jail and, you know, go to visiting rooms and conduct um, a, a psychoanalysis with with people that they befriend in jail, because that's the only way the jail will 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 sort of let you in on a massive level. It's so repressive. But there there is a space also, though, for formal, um, you know, for formal clinicians, because doctors are these anointed weird people that, you know, especially if they have an MD that can, that can get permission to enter that forbidden space. Sorry to go on so long. Right. In the interest of, of, of time, then I'm going to read also Helena's questions. Uh, that question, um, um, uh, please um, keep in your mind about the opening of um, the moment of incarceration to some extent, to the possibility of psychoanalytic conversation. Um, and then Helena's question, um, I'll read uh, here. Uh, in the past year, there's been renewed white mainstream attention to structural racism and the underlying institutions and policies that enforce racial inequalities without the need for individual bias, how do the structural mechanisms of racism intersect with benefits of individual analysis, uh, given that some criticize the individual focus of, uh, the individualist focus of implicit bias interventions as doomed to failure in the face of these structures? Um, and then a secondary question that goes along with that is, um, the choice of a dark-skinned Dominican patient to illustrate racism, in this case, internalized racism, raises the question of work on racism among white patients who more directly benefit materially, if not in terms of their souls, than dark-skinned Dominicans. And so how has your construct worked with white patients along these lines? So I think those two questions can be maybe taken together and then there's another one after that. So, so maybe to put together these two questions would be when I, I was trying to understand, was there for Ramona any profit in her uh, racist fantasy? And, and I appeal without saying it explicitly to a, a notion that I find very helpful uh, from Lacan, that of jouissance, which is this idea of pain and pleasure, it hurts so good when pain and pleasure cannot be differentiated. And, uh, and it's, a, it's a, a notion that, that Lacan adds and, and borrows from political economy more explicitly from Karl Marx when he talks about surplus value in the same way that in capitalistic production, there would be a surplus that the capitalistic, uh, the, the, that it will amount to the capital of the owner of the factory that does not go to the worker who is producing a commodity whose value exceeds what the worker is paid for the production of that commodity. There is a, 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 an, an introjection in the unconscious of these uh, uh, structural dynamics. And Lacan uses this notion of enjoyment of sense of uh, unconscious painful profit. And I think it would work for maybe an analysis of how the, the, the prison com industrial complex works at the level of, uh, it's, it's a very big industry producing a lot of profit, but also at the individual level that there is, uh, the subject may find, the, the, say the person who ends up sent to prison repeatedly, may find as a strategy of survival extract some gain, some unconscious gain, some enjoyment in this horrible situation they find themselves in. And what psychoanalysis can attack is that uh, unconscious gain and introduce a different kind of economy, a different kind of dynamic that uh, implies that at times as a survival, one may 
uh, identify, and I think this is a little what was happening with Ramona, that she, she was profiting from this horrible discourse that was making herself and others a victim. Uh, and of course it could happen as well. I think with the, we have racism is a construction that is not only in the case of a Dominican dark skin analysis. And I hear racism in, in many analysis and it's equally enjoyable, equally profitable and equally uh, uh, made itself available for analysis and a different economy if we can mobilize uh, the unconscious investment in this uh, situation. And uh, I think uh, you are giving me a good idea, Philippe. I will, I will talk to, to people if, if, if prisons would be open to psychoanalysis. I know many people who wouldn't mind doing work. I, I remember even this idea of Suissance. I was uh, once having a, a conversation with a grad student at Pittsburgh in the psychoanalytic program, is psychoanalytic psychology, who was working with the prison guards. And he was telling me that at least in, in, in the, the, the group he was uh, working with, doing uh, research with, most prison guards belonged to families where generation after generation had been prison guards. And I remember I asked him, what do they get out of it? The idea of Suissance. And he was very surprised by my question and, and said, okay, I will, I will try to figure out that they have even for, for the prison guard, there has to be this unconscious profit, or maybe I imagine a bank teller who does that job because loves the feeling on the skin of touching the banknotes. And is there where we find the unique, singular, the, 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 and I'm, I'm giving you one possible answer, what, what makes that person uh, find themselves, or it's a way of hooking into the structure in their own singular, peculiar way, overdetermined by the family history, by the trauma, by uh, where, where and how they were wounded as they were growing up. And that's what a psychoanalysis could re reorganize in a way that will grant them a little more freedom. I don't know if that answers both questions. There's, um, there's one more question, which is maybe a good question for um, the last question, if it ends up being that. Um, and this is from Greg Gabrellis. How can we think about political advocacy to make publicly financed psychoanalysis a more meaningful part of the conversation? We are struggling just to get basic health care, such as general surgery for people. How do we get from where we are now to effectively demanding a universal right to an unconscious? Well, hopefully, Greg, thank you for the question. Hopefully what we are talking today, I think I, I think of the example of Argentina. In Argentina, uh, everyone does psychoanalysis, rich and poor, and public hospitals that are free. So then there you have access to basic health care for free at the staying run. They all have the psychoanalytic unit and, and uh, analysts is, are expected to work there a few hours a week. It's part of, of your job. You may be teaching and, uh, and uh, you often teaching in Argentina also is unpaid. So you teach you work in the hospital and then you have your private practice for those who can pay it. And, and that's how you make ends meet. So it's not, doesn't mean that a psychoanalyst has to be a sort of sacrifice here. I think we have to rethink, uh, I think we have to rethink what, how we think of, of a, a body with a soul, how we think of humans. And I think it's a basic human right, access to health, a body and soul, so I would say, the surgery and the psychoanalysis that in Argentina, most health insurance cover for psychoanalysis and analysts, all analysts that I know, there may be exceptions, but most analysts offer sliding scale. They would charge according to whatever the analysis may be able to afford. So it's not considered a way of becoming, analysts don't go into analysis to become rich. They do it for other, with other motivations and I think at least what we are talking today could be the beginning, how to think of political advocacy. Maybe the, uh, not thinking that access to the unconscious is a luxury would be the first. It's not a luxury. Maybe it's a necessity, maybe. Like surgery, as Floyd said.
Let's... We have, how are we doing with time? We have maybe time for one more. One more, one more short question. <laughs> So what do we have? I'll, I'll, I'll give you a short question. <laughs> um, so I was really intrigued by your invoking laughter um, in, your, mm -hmm. in your analysis. And um, the relationship of laughter to racism is really interesting. Um, so um, because we, as we all know, it happens on so many different registers. We certainly saw in North Philadelphia, a lot of joking around the subject of race. Um, mm -hmm. And it had complex functions, I would say. Um, mm -hmm. interestingly complex functions, which I hope we'll explore when we write about them. But, um, but I'm, I'm therefore wondering um, what, um, you know, if you could say just something more about, about laughter and about your own um, um, understanding of it and mm -hmm. how it can be directed <laughs> given its um, complexity in, in the way that you are, um, Exactly. Can I just add, um, yeah. it, if you could add to this, uh, the, the last part of Helena's, um, uh, Helena Hansen's question, which is the, 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 the fundamental, the, the benefits of racism, the material benefits of racism being distinct across the different the different people who participate in racism, and there is, um, um, and, and in that sense, the 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 the, the sort of interstitial position of Dominicans, um, uh, both because of the more diverse color of their skin than than most of the people in the neighborhood, ranging from you know absolutely black to absolutely white, but all being poor in the neighborhood. And um, and and so forth. But the, 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 but um, anyhow, thanks. Sorry, I'll be quiet. So um, indeed, there is a, and also I mean, what made me think this idea of let's not that race is a construct, but that construct don't, doesn't work the same for everyone. I, I was uh, reminded of a, the comment of a, a Mexican colleague that when he was in Mexico, he was white. When he moved to the US, he became brown. And, and how you, you challenge these, these are constructs that indeed not everyone may profit in the same way. But uh, if we assume that uh, every person involved may put some of their subjectivity at play, and this is where we may have a little a space to, to undo the effects of this uh, structure. As for humor, uh, for many years, psychoanalysis took the model of tragedy. And, uh, and the tragedy is very seductive, it's a wonderful <laughs> art form, but the problem in tragedy is that the hero dies at the end. So I prefer to take as a model for psychoanalysis comedy where the heroes falls in the soup and jumps and comes down, form from the cliff, goes to the bottom of the mountain and keeps on running. So comedy is a sort of highway and joking and humor and laughter, a highway to the unconscious, that we can take a shortcut and, and address things that could take a long time if you go through the slow trial. And also the lives in the barrier are so marked by tragedy. The social location is so uh, full of tragedy that introducing humor and comedy reinstates agency because if you can laugh about something you are in a position of agency and you see yourself from the outside as it were also the idea that laughter is something that like the unconscious happens to us we don't fully control when you suddenly laugh you it's not something one can unless it's can laughter to maybe go back to models of prison or or maybe uh, going to perhaps more psychoanalytic uh, anal associations that uh, spontaneous laughter is on the side of a subjective freedom. And it, it allows the, the person, I, I'm talking about clinically, when I make a joke and, and the uh, analysis and myself, we both laugh or the analysis makes a joke and we both laugh. We are uh, in a way challenging our, both our positions. We were talking earlier on about hierarchies, authorities, when we are both laughter, it's a way of, uh, as Freud observes in, in uh, his uh, work on wits, you can uh, do without all the restrictions of the superego. It's a way of avoiding censorship. 
and accessing a form of enjoyment that is not lethal. That's why I was talking about uh, tragedy kills the hero. Comedy, uh, you laugh and you keep on, it's, it's on the side of life. It, it, it factors in the death drive, but in a way that you survive it. Right. So it gives, it gives a, a much more uh, possibility for movement and transformation in, in positioning. And it's a form of uh, accepting transgression that is not uh, completely destructive. If I could make one point to that. Yes. I recently learned how valuable it was to show humanity with humor. My car had to go into the shop mm -hmm. and the brake wasn't working. So I took a long time to get started because it wouldn't release. So I take it in, they take care of it. And they're very nice to me. Of course, I bribe them with you know cookies and, and whatnot. <laughs> so all the people who work in my car, like they're ready to help. So I get the car back. It's great, it looks perfect. I drive out and I realize there's a notice on the dashboard with a star and it says, check left, check right. I'm tired, I'm driving. I check left, I check right. But the sign wouldn't go away. I did that for a few more minutes and suddenly my alter ego says, take the car back. I took the car back, I tell the guys, it says, check left, check right. They get out of where they are, go to the front of the car and go, we forgot to reattach the headlights. And I said, oh, so whereas we're paying and everyone's thanking me for my kindness, they said, so how'd you find that out? And I told them what I did. And they're so kind to me. They look down and I know they're thinking she's a doctor and she doesn't know that the car is talking about itself, not giving her directions. And so I thought, they said, so, oh, they said, they looked at me, they said, Dr. Carter, you be safe, okay? And I said, okay, I will. Well, I told that story to my patients last week they all laughed. I said, that's wonderful. I said, just because I'm intelligent doesn't mean I know everything. And then they were able to laugh and see me as more human and that I'm being honest. So they know that the stories I tell them are true and honest. And then they begin to disclose their issues and we can laugh at some of the things they did. And I said, well, at least I know that it's not like those games where they mean you to respond. I said, but I did look left and right. They said, yes, but it wasn't talking to you. So I find humor is very important and I routinely I have to give them books about funny jokes or tell them things that are funny so they can step out of themselves, experience another person's, th see what empathy feels like, and then realize they can use that story for something else. That's what I do. So thanks so much for mentioning it. Okay, I wanna bring this to an end now because we're, the, we're at the end of our time. Thank you so much everyone for your um, excellent you. comments and questions. And thank you, Patricia. So people have said this was a really inspiring talk. Um, I see heads nodding, so that's great. So um, stay in touch, feel free to, if you can pass along my email. I'll, I'll write the email, my email if people want to contact me so we could continue. Um, yes, it's, it's, you know, um, it's on, you put it on the email in the chat, that will reach everyone right now. So let's see everyone in the team. There, good. There we go. So everybody, thank you. Money. Thank you, Marcia, for the invitation. Thanks, thank you. everybody. Nice. The, um, if you email me, if you um, want to know where the recording is, we hopefully should get it posted by Monday. Thanks, Patricia. Thank and, you. Um, thanks, everyone. And, and come to our, our, our three incarceration, uh, mass yeah, incarceration. Yeah, let, let me know when you're back here. I'll, I'll, and and I'll, I'll ask around. I'm sure there would be people who, if they, oh, the prisons are available, I know people who would want to do work there. So. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Bye, Bye, everyone. Bye.